Thank you so much, and thank you all for coming bright and early to the first session of the day. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to have a great group here this morning. So, uh, as you may be aware, yesterday, Hudson Yards finally opened to the public. Developer Steve Ross, the chairman of Related Properties, which developed it, describes it as New York's next great neighborhood. And the, I think the question of this panel is, is uh, to some extent, does Steve Ross have the right to actually say this is New York's next great neighborhood? Who makes the city? Uh, Fifty years ago, Jane Jacobs, of course, you know, uh, campaigned against Robert Moses, arguing that no master developer could build the kind of finely grained, textured city that we live in and love. And now we're sort of faced with the opposite end, where we now have developers building entire cities from scratch here in our city. So I think that's part of the framing that we're going to get to. So it's my delight to have a really fascinating mix of people d examining what makes New York great and, and what pieces we can learn from what makes great places and great cities. So I want to introduce our panelists. We're going to start with first Luca Ballerini, who's joining us here from Torino. Uh, he's the founder and creative director of Bellissimo and the curator of Torino Stratosferica. Um, he is the man who runs a conference, uh, urban conference that starts at night, so I highly recommend you attend sometime. Uh, next up joining us is Story Bellows, who's a partner at Cityfy, uh, which is a creative consultancy that's basically trying to develop humane smart cities, and smart cities that actually work for people instead of working for the companies that supply it. Uh, next up is Shinpei Sai, who's the executive director of the Gale Institute. Uh, Gale was spun off of uh, Gale Architects. Yan Gale is the Copenhagen architect who inspired Jeanette City Khan to pedestrianize Times Square. Uh, and finally, we have Paul Whalen, who's a partner at Robert A.M. Stern Architects. Uh, of course, you know, the designers of many fine buildings in New York uh, who are working to basically export New Yorkerism to the world. So can we have a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you. I guess I'd like to start with Paul here as, a, as our architect on here, because we, we have an architect, we have, what, we have an urbanist and an urbanist and an urbanist, I guess we could say, from various disciplines. Um, but as our reigning architect, Paul, you, you were showing me backstage that you made a, you made a field trip to, to, uh, to Hudson Yards before joining us. Um, and yeah, I, I'd love to hear sort of your report on it. I know uh, we shouldn't get too much into it, and there's much more to discuss. Um, but it raises questions about, you know, what should New York look like in the 21st century? You know, we have the largest development in the city's maybe in the his city's history, at least that's Rockefeller Center. Um, so how does it hold up to the rest of New York as we know it? Well, I want to say that, um, first of all, that I think that traditional New York urbanism is among the best urbanism in the world. And that, and, and we do a lot of work in China at our firm, and master planning, and the Chinese love New York. And so what we do is we look to the best of New York urbanism, and we actually bring it to China and they love it. And, uh, and so why not, when big new projects are being built in New York, why not look to traditional New York urbanism and learn from it and, and do a continuation of it is what I would recommend. Now this morning, um, and by the way, Related is one of my clients, so you know, I'm not gonna trash anybody. Duly noted. Um, um, uh, at this morning, I, I, w I walked over there and uh, the one thing I would say is that um, I wanted to get a cup of coffee, and uh, I couldn't get a cup of coffee on the street. And walking into the mall, I couldn't, I had to walk past a bunch of fashion shops and make a right and make a left and go up, practically go upstairs to get a coffee. And I do think any project, it's gonna be up for a long time, can change over a period of time and, and, and be adjusted. And I, I would hope that maybe as that project uh, develops and, and matures, that, uh, that there would be some effort to open up to the street a bit more so that just people in the neighborhood can get a cup of coffee. And frankly, it was such a relief to come over here to see the wonderful morning light washing the streets with light, it was beautiful. And I could look out from the Y and see three different places where I could get a nice morning cup of coffee and it was a treat. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, Shinpei, uh, coming, coming to the notion of how cities change and, and watch them evolve in terms of how do you build better places. So, so Yan Gale, the Copenhagen architect, uh, in addition to sort of being famous for Copenhagenizing cities with bicycles and what we think of that, was also one of the first architects to pioneer observational techniques to actually observe how people use places, like Melbourne in the 1960s. So I was hoping, hoping you could talk a bit about your work because part of what Gale Institute's doing is taking that very anecdotal observational technique and trying to codify it and trying to learn what makes places great. So I'm curious, what have you learned running Gale Institute and how do we turn that into data that could be shared, exported, and, and sort of develop these principles of how do we build better cities? Yeah, great. It's such a good question, something that we've been thinking a lot about, and I think it's a, the marriage of 
data, but really with an understanding of the social impacts of how cities should be created. So um, it's not about data per se, it's more about trying to insert the human needs, human desires, the real human everyday experience back into the formulas of these large, whether they're large developments or streetscape redesigns or um, whatever, whatever kind of public realm project that you might have. And what we are trying to do is systematize it because that's just the way that um, you're able to create more opportunities for those human-centered needs to show up in all these different kinds of developments. So, you know, back at, you know, maybe when Yen started his practice um, or started his research, which was really back in the 70s, he had to do this quite anecdotally, project by project, and constantly asserting this point of view. And you know, fast forward to today, we have so many different ways of being able to create systems around collecting this data, to, um, to understanding insertions in the process, to use this data, but it's not like data, cold data, it's really about the qualitative nature of the way people use spaces and really trying to import that into all of the conversations about how spaces are created. Thanks. And Story, before you were at City5, of course, you were at the Brooklyn Public Libraries working on innovation there. And I was hoping you could talk a bit about, because City5, you know, is a super, super group, I like to say, you know, like in the old sense of like cream or like, you know, old, old groups. It's Story and uh, Gabe Klein and John Tolva and Ashley Hand, all of whom were CIOs and, and chief, uh, you know, mobility czars for various cities like Washington, D.C. and Chicago. Um, from the government side, how do, you know, how do we basically build a better city? How do we basically allow the planning process to be more opened up and to be sped up and to be more democratized so that we can build a better city versus just the sort of lumbering city processes of this? Because like, we were discussing a bit backstage, you know, in the cases like Hudson Yards or like Sidewalk Toronto, which is the controversial Google city in Toronto, the government was involved. They wrote RFPs and these companies responded to them. So there's an argument that the public sector is just as much at fault for whatever results we get out of it. So I'm curious, in, your, in working with cities, which is what CityFi does, um, how, do we, yeah, how do we educate our public servants to make them better at this? I think one of the things that we really need to focus on is outcomes. Um, and I think all too often when cities engage with the private sector, which is really what cities do, that's how we make change happen, is by making contracts with various private entities. Um, and I think cities, have long been in the business of being way too prescriptive when we write RFPs. We assume that we have complete understanding of a problem, and then we prescribe an outcome. And that doesn't really create space for innovation, I don't think. So I think we need to figure out what is it that we really care about. We really care about equity. We really care about sustainability. We really care about you know, a whole host of other things. And figure out how do we engage others in being able to deliver creative solutions that meet those outcomes, as opposed to telling them, here are the particular inputs or outputs that I'm expecting. I think we want to allow for creative partnerships, but we need to enable various partners to be able to exhibit their creativity by, by not prescribing exactly what they're supposed to do. Yeah, well, wait, well, well, getting into free form and non-prescriptive, this is where Luca comes in. So Luca's a bit of the outlier on here. Where Luca basically built, yeah, you built a festival to create change, essentially, or, or sort of collect ideas. So I was hoping you talk a bit about Stratospherica and the sort of most grassroots version, where you really sort of engage citizens of Torino to reimagine their city. So how, how did you go about doing that? Well, I think the, 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 the main question is uh, uh, not just why, uh, how do we build better cities, but also why are we still building cities, you know? Um, Very European question. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's not so uh, usual, you know. We have to understand that cities are probably the best invention of human being, and um, if we if we go back to the to the theory of why cities uh, ex existed in the first place, I think the most fascinating theory is the cosmic theory that says that you know human beings created cities as a response to what they saw above themselves in the sky okay so this kind of relationship between what we are and and and, and the rest of the world and the cosmos uh, it, the spiritual side of being into a city should be much more uh, brought into what we develop today so um, yes i mean i think we are on uh, we're not builder of course we're not architects what we do 
is uh, we try to imagine how cities could be transformed. And we're also very uh, concerned about how cities can be told because you know storytelling or city telling is very important. I come from a city that most of you probably don't know, Turin in Italy. And uh, it's, it's important for, for, for us and for every city, m you know, a little bit less for New York because it's <laughs> very well known, but it's very important to, uh, to make people understand why the city is uh, unique in itself. So uh, what we're trying to do, and I think this is also uh, you know, providing better cities somehow, is to identify and, and, and stress the things that are making our city unique. And this is a very creative process. It, it has to do with imagination, it has to do with creativity, it has to do with desires. So we have to ask ourselves, uh, what's my desire for my city, really? I mean, what do I want to, how do I want to commute? What do I want to take my school to, my, my kids to school? And you know, all these basic questions about how do we live in the city? are, for me, most of the time uh, forgotten when we develop or we, when we think about new uh, developments uh, because we're, you know, there's much more greed about how, you know, how can we uh, make the most of the use of the land and, you know, having more uh, rich people coming in. And so these problems are, uh, most of the cities are facing these problems. London is more or less the same. Uh, and Milan, Milan has the same problem. So uh, it's as true as uh, uh, Story was saying. You know, we have to we have to understand how to build um, cities who are more just, more uh, equal, uh, but also more livable. And uh, I think we could do that by bringing more imagination to to yeah to the design process and also involving the creative industry people who are eager to express their desires in in the in the process yeah i mean that you raise a very important point here which should be stated up front here which is you know when we say how do we build a better city there's a real question of what city are we building obviously the superstar cities of the world of which new york is one is very different Paul was mentioning he's going to Jakarta. I mean, if you really want to see the urban front lines, go to the global south mega cities. There's, of course, the struggling cities of America and the Rust Belt. These, the, you know, it raises some interesting questions, which I guess gets to, as we'll open this up here, um, what is universally exportable out of New York or your own experience of how do we build a better city that can be applied other places of this? D is there a palliative toolkit that we can use to address uh, inequality in the superstar cities, to address how do we jumpstart development in struggling cities? How do we make urban you know, uh, places like Jakarta, which you have tower, rice paddy, mega highway, repeat, um, kind of thing like that. So I don't know if that is any, any particular thoughts. Paul, I know you're big on like, that you know, your Chinese clients love some of the bits and pieces of New York, that there are parts of New York that there's a set of pieces that can be deployed there. So I'm curious, yeah, how yeah, do you make I China more like New York? I wanna talk about the sort of formal qualities of New York, or just sort of what it looks like. And the classic New York block, where there are uh, avenues going north-south, and most of the tall buildings are on the avenues, the small buildings are on the side streets, allows for a lot of south light to get into those side streets. It allows for businesses to be on the avenues, but then uh, it allows for, for people to live in, in townhouses, either by themselves or maybe they've been broken down into apartments so that within one block in New York, you can have a high-rise life, you can have a low-rise life, and you could even have a super high-rise life. And, and I don't mind some super tall buildings in New York because one of the things they do is, is by transferring air rights is that they allow historic low buildings to still exist. And so I'm sort of, you know, I, I just don't mind that at all, especially if those tall buildings uh, adhere to the, the street standards of New York. In China, they love New York partially because New York is such a great brand and they've seen it in the movies. And what we, we see our job is going there and saying, you know, we know you love it for vague reasons. Let us explain to you why it works so well, why the urbanism of New York works so well. And that's always, it's a bit of an education, but we've had really good luck with it, actually. And, uh, and one of the things that I think is great about New York, but just basically, is that it's, it's the only pre-war high-rise city in the world that's com largely high-rise and it's pre-war. And so there was this wonderful urbanism established where there are tall buildings next to low buildings, that, and because they're all punched wall masonry buildings, they all fit together really nicely. The details work together. You can go from a 25-story 
apartment building to a three-story townhouse right next to it, and they look perfectly great together. Um, and but when when you start to do uh, a 50-story glass building next to a three-story masonry townhouse, things don't go so well. I don't think. Interesting how the mix fits together. Story and Champagne, I, you talked a bit about you talked about data, of course, and sort of outcomes. And I'm curious about. Um, how you've seen this in your both of your work, uh, things that are changing, right? When it comes to either comes to uh, public place design. So you know, in the video that we were watching of Hudson Yards that Paul took, the most shocking part to me was these big windswept plazas, which I just thought we stopped building these big empty plazas that used to be built in Midtown. Um, instead, we build more pocket parks. We built, you know, you see there's a rise of parklets where they turn parking spaces into parks. Lots of interventions around the world, things like this that are evolving. Um, I'm curious what you guys have seen in terms of like that and other sort of, you know, where you're able to convince cities that we can have, we can build a city a different way, whether it's congestion pricing and a lot of the mobility work that CityFi has done with its partners or, yeah, the public space design that you've done, Shinpei. I don't know if either of you would want to take that. Yeah, and I also kind of want to jump back Please. into this conversation of what we're exporting as well. I think part of this is like the process. Um, it's not just the products of New York that we should export. I think like, events like this or the work that libraries are doing in terms of having conversations with communities, that gets us to, I mean, I think talking about outcomes is this very like government-y approach, but it's really like, what are the values that we hold true as a city, as a neighborhood, as a particular community? And then how do we hold ourselves to that? And so I think that's where we start, to, if we care about equal access to the street and we can all agree like at the highest level like we care about something like equity then it starts to create I think the opportunities for these conversations around what are the strategies or the tactics that you use so I think having those values and agreeing on those up front with the work that we're doing with various like public and private sector clients is really critical to get to those agreement points so that you can then move into, okay, you guys said you really all agree on this. Now we're gonna have to make some like some difficult choices in terms of what are the strategies that we're gonna deploy, what kind of resources we're gonna use, um, and what tactics we ultimately take. And just just to be bridge the um, the two comments here, I I actually think one of the great things that we could export from New York is a lot of the innovation in process where we are working a lot at the intersections of planning, design, and public health, of equity and architecture, of um, public safety and crime prevention and public space. And the process specifically that I think um, other places could learn from, which isn't necessarily absolutely you know, built, born in New York, but I think really got developed over New York's history is this constant ability to um, ex experiment, to tweak, and then to keep going, to then innovate again. And this reimagining, this constant reimagining, the constant um, resetting of objectives. So in this case, I think, you know, our work intersects quite frequently with equity and trying to define what those objectives are and then really putting, applying that to, to real life projects, to working with uh, community groups to really recognize the lived experiences of these communities, to recognize the historical um, systemic issues that they might have experienced in the past, and then to then create a future and to create an understanding of where it could go. What's an example of this? Because like, you're describing an incredibly innovative city that I don't recognize <laughs> right now, frankly. Well, I would say that these examples are, not th so it might not happen at a top-down perspective, but this is what's amazing about New York, I think, is that when I go to Europe, they, they are in awe of New York, not just for the architecture and the urbanism, but for the get-up-and-go attitude of people in the city, where anyone in the city, even if they're not a profes so-called professional, has a sense that maybe they can make a difference, or that's sort of a, not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not universal, but I think that it's an attitude that New Yorkers bring to a lot of different sectors that I really love and love to communicate to other places. Um, and so I th I'm thinking about all the activity that's going on in Brownsville, for example, Brooklyn, and, and how that's really 
there are external forces for sure, but also hugely deeply embedded local community forces that are saying, hey, this is our neighborhood. We get to decide what's going on here. Thank you for coming to help us. This is how we want to use you <laughs> and use your expertise to create the place that we finally will get to define in our city, in, in our neighborhood. And I think that's something that um, could be patterned a bit more in other places. Um, and was really tested out, he it's being really tested out here. Yeah, there's some really interesting tools like that, like participatory budgeting and, and what else uh, to, to do to make uh, communities more involved. Luca, as the, as the resident European on the panel, you get to, I, I have to ask you questions beyond simply your narrow expertise, but I was hoping you'd talk a, a bit more again about your own work in activating people in the city, but also if, you're, if, you have, if you've seen other models of bottom-up governance. I'm really fascinated, for example, by Barcelona and the municipalist movement. This is the whole movement where the city, really, you have community groups that elect people into office, and then the elected officials pledge that they're going to take decisions from the community group. So Ada Colau, the mayor of Barcelona, could really be described as like the Spanish version of AOC, where she was a community organizer, and then she you know, became mayor, and now the, they're leading this sort of completely new model of governance that they're trying to, to export as well. So I'm curious what else you've seen in terms of how do we get citizens more involved directly into the process of this? Well, um, I think it's, it might be interesting to, to tell a little bit about our story because we were involved around 2011, 2012 as designers and uh, editors to, uh, to the third strategic plan of the city of Turin. Turin was famous in 2000 for uh, putting out the very first strategic plan in Europe at least. And so it was not a, a, you know, an urban plan, planning, uh, you know, but it was just about uh, values and vision. And it helped a lot in 2000 because we were ahead of the Olympic Games, the Winter Olympic Games that happened in 2006. But the first strategic plan was a, a, a kind of a nightmare between, <laughs> uh, you know, we, I mean, the city didn't really know where to go. This is the problem. And uh, so we spent two years in uh, interviewing more than, I don't know, 200 people, uh, very important people of the city to understand what was the vision, but the vision was lacking. And uh, my suggestion during those that, that process was, why don't we hear about the creative industry leaders who are always on the cutting edge, always on the, you know, pushing the envelope. They're traveling a lot, they are uh, inviting people from all over the world for, to their festival, and so we, we should hear from them. And this suggestion wasn't uh, somehow accepted, so I decided to start Torino Stratosferica out of that by myself with you know my resources and my time and my team. And we've, we've done that again. So we invited 200 people from the creative industry uh, who are very free, who can express their values because you know they are independent. They they are not uh, in in the process of developing the cities themselves. So they they want to be heard, and we asked them, "What's the city uh, you'd like? How to Torino could be at its best? Tell me what's your desires about the city." And yeah, I mean, I is it a participatory process? Yes, in a way, but it's very selective. It's very elitarian. I know that. But this is also a response to how participatory processes usually, for me, are kind of, you know, we have to f say that somehow they are a little bit of a failure because you do them and then you don't really care about what's the result, let's face it. Most of the time people are, okay, well, yeah, we've done a participatory process that we heard about the community, but then we build what we want to build, <laughs> like you said, from you know, also from us and yards. So I think that uh, we should be much more bold and ambitious right from the beginning. Okay, so we we have to understand that uh, somehow we are still able to do something very big, like uh, thinking in, in grander terms, like uh, Hoisman did in Paris. You know, it took 80 years to repay. What he done in, in what he did in in Paris, you know, he was able to go to bank and say, "Hey, listen, you're gonna <laughs> you lend me money, we'll do this, and in 20 years you'll be paid back." But it wasn't true, so he had to be much more ambitious that he, you know, than that he was. So, I mean, th this is something that uh, we we should uh, be be clear about the the fact that cities today are not just about um, you know being able to, to, to take everything, ev every complexity into consideration, but also the fact that we should be bold in expressing our desire 
and, and confront it with, with policy makers, with developers, uh, right up from the beginning. This is my point of view, from the bottom up. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, we're going to go to the audience in just a moment, but I have one last question for them for our panel, which we get into, which is, you know, I'm, uh, I'm trained as a journalist, so the first question we're always taught to ask is, or, or dictum to follow, is follow the money. Um, and so when it comes to building a better city, all of us up here, none of us uh, are, are financiers, none of us are, are generating this, and it's, I think it's telling that, you know, Robert Moses, of course, was able to build an empire on the backs of the tolls he collected from the Triborough Commission, which he could then expand into other areas. And Hudson Yards exists, of course, because it is a for-profit enterprise. You can get financing on that. So I'm curious what all of you have seen other models of financing this. How do we build a better city where, for example, we can crowdsource uh, development, platforms like Fundrise and others, uh, you know, other utopian versions, what people have called Kickstarter urbanism, somewhat derogatorily, um, or are there other approaches of how we can basically reimagine the city that goes beyond simply sort of for-profit, the for-profit development model, which is basically the topic of conversation in the rest of this conference. I, I have to say, I think that grand gestures can't rely on, I, I don't think, on grassroots uh, growth. I think that grassroots are great for, uh, for smaller uh, uh, ideas and for, uh, for achieving a, a wonderful fine, fine grain texture. And so I think the challenge is when the money comes in and they have the ability to do something grand, how to make sure that they do something that works, say, for instance, for the, the, uh, the creative individual, which I think everybody agrees is sort of the heart of a vibrant city, and how do you do something that works for them? And to my mind, that is about variety, and it's about fine-grained uh, detail, and it seems to me that that's what creative people want. They don't want a, co a corporate environment. But how do we... Uh, get uh, developers and even people at city planning to understand and make sure that that, that fine grain quality that I, th that I think everybody loves uh, uh, gets incorporated into big scale projects. So I, I don't know exactly what the answer is, but that's what I would hope for. All right, any other responses? We'll move I mean, on. I was going to Go say ahead, from sorry. a mechanism standpoint, and I don't, there's a company called Neighborly that's been around for a few years, and I don't know, I think their model has evolved a little bit. But they were, at the start, they were talking about like community level bond ownership and really democratizing the municipal bond. Um, and I don't want everybody to fall asleep on a Saturday morning talking about municipal bonds, but I think that's a mechanism that if we can really start to think about like, shifting ownership back to communities where they're potentially going to benefit from the investments that are made and bringing those like levels of investment down so that they are more accessible to a lot of different people could be an interesting model to explore. Yeah, you thought we were going to have an interesting morning and <laughs> say we're talking about muni bonds, but <laughs> go ahead. And maybe moving away from uh, bonds, but potentially not, a, not an extremely sexy topic, but um, I think that there's a lot of op loss opportunity too with um, how the how agencies, public agencies that have purview over the public realm, um, are not are not you know just not taking advantage of those opportunities. So I think just back to the idea of setting objectives and holding values over what we're really trying to achieve. Um, let's say with a NYCHA housing development, and then really thinking about like what does that really mean to provide for not just shelter but the entire well-being of this, and thinking about though about the residents as a community, um, there's a lot that can be done, extremely challenging right now, of course, recognizing the structural issues um, with NYCHA as an agency, but just the idea, this concept of, if we're really define, redefining the values of, um, you know, that we want to hold up, then I think city agencies actually have a huge opportunity to think about where they have effect. And so it's not so much a financing mechanism, but doing more with what we have and really thinking also beyond the building, but into the maintenance phase, the long long term sustainability of those places with people. And I, you know, I know there's um, any particip participation right now f sometimes gets a pejorative um, kind of status, I think, in these conversations because people feel very frustrated at how little you, it seems it's the incrementalism feels very frustrating. But on the other hand, I think that um, without that, you don't get that fine-grained um, experience. You don't really recognize the human um, scale. And, and then why are we building these giant places for anyway? 
All right, we're, we have uh, we only have about six, seven minutes left here, or maybe we'll be pushed a little bit here. So we're going to move to lightning round because true to form, 90 Seconds Street Y gets excellent audience questions. Thank you for these. Sorry, so can I just say one thing about yes, how, quickly, how do we raise quickly. money? Um, I think that, you know, talking about um, values, it's true, but also ideals, I mean, desires again. Like uh, Patrick Geddes, the Scottish urbanist and sociologist, uh, I'm trying to, to, to think... Um, how was he able to, you know, to gain money to from to raise money for for building the Outlook Tower in Edinburgh, or for building the f the first civic center? It wasn't because he, he was able to, you know, to pay off. It was just because he was communicating his ideas, and people, uh, wealthy people, were believing in that. So we should, you know, very humbly go back to that. You know, can I, I, am I able to? make you give me some money to do something which is more ideal and not just concrete? This is the good question for me. No. All right, so lightning round. We're going to address first question. Try to keep these answers to about a minute, and we'll see where we can go. But the first one, I'm going to say for Shinpei, um, shouldn't the starting point for urban planners be asking what kind of environment is inviting and comfortable for human beings? A question that has obsessed Yan Gale. So what have you found in your observations and data approach that, uh, that uh, what kind of environment is inviting and comfortable for human beings? So the short answer is yes, should they, yes. And um, well, I think, I think that generally uh, things that provide for the basic everyday experiences, um, recognizing what that means for a neighborhood rather than kind of the iconic images and then layering that in with the iconic planning is the ideal situation. There's a lot of social science behind it. I have a minute. But um, you know, just thinking about what is it that people actually like to do, how are they doing it, is is the starting point. Thank you, Paul. Uh, important question here: Have you considered the Chinese culture when bringing your work to China? This raises the interesting question about is urbanism normative, and New York perfected urbanism, and now we should make every place look like New York. So how do you how do you deal with those cultural considerations? Uh, we 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 do well. First of all, we have cl Chinese clients who are very familiar with uh, with Chinese culture. Uh, Chinese culture is changing a lot right now. Uh, uh, it, in a way, uh, they were shut off from the rest of the world for 50 years and are now very eager to join the rest of the world. We have to remember, I think many people think that the Chinese are so different from the world, they're not from everybody else, they're not. And there was a huge amount of urbanism in China, frankly, before 1948, that was very similar to Paris or to New York. And, but then they were sort of cut off and they want to sort of catch up, which is why they're so interested at looking at what they missed in that period of time. And they think of New York actually as a place that in a way that where they could have been if they had continued to grow in a, in a sort of linear fashion. Um, and so I, I would just say that, look, they like South Life. They like, uh, 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 they, they like to have, um, uh, apartments that have flow through circulation, they like to have their windows open. So we take care of all that in our buildings, but in the end, they also like to have great streets, just like anybody else, great streets and squares and parks. They're just not so different. And so uh, we make a few te tweaks to what we do here. And frankly, if you were to see one of our uh, uh, projects that we've done in China, you would not think, oh, that looks like New York. Um, but it's it's really it's sort of the sort of the secret sauce that's mixed in that that brings in the variety of New York and that I think that that's been so successful for us and it's, our it's clients. It's good to know that our present is China's retro future. Um, uh, story, can you share specific examples of cities that are healthy and support well-being? Why now? I imagine the Cityfy work has seen the sort of work to create walkable pedestrian environments to promote uh, healthier, more active modes, at the very least. Yeah, right. so I would, I mean, one of the cities that we have done a little bit of work with, but the city of Santa Monica has been working on creating kind of a well-being index for the last six years or so. Um, so that's one place that I would certainly point to where they are really looking at incorporating a lot of different values to that. Um, Miami, Denver, um, West Hollywood, we finished a, a smart city strategic plan for them. And you know, they're a tiny city compared to New York, basically like a neighborhood um, inside Los Angeles. Um, but they really have um, focused on making their smart city technology like actually work for humans. And I think at the end of the day, like we are urbanists before we are technologists. And I think all of this smart city work needs to support the on-the-ground lived experience of 
humans in cities. All right, Luca, how do you sell creativity, design process, innovation to the public sector? How do you convince the government that it's important? Because it's visual and it's very simple. It's uh, synthetic, so we try to you know, do a synthesis about what people has to say, and it's very visual based, it's very image driven, as you saw from, from the slides. You know. So people, you know, yesterday there was a talk where, where they talk a lot about social media, and we're more and more used to, to, to somehow express our judgment uh, just by looking at a single image, and uh, this could be the same for a, for a government if if we're talking about how the city could be transformed into something else, probably the importance of one single very well curated image image is very important for for the citizens to participate, to make their judgment, and and so uh, I think the ability to uh, bring forward new images, and so we go back to the imagination and the participatory process, but also a very uh, synthetic uh, short claim is very helpful. So mm, this is the creative process we want to engage with more and more. All right, and one final question for each of you, the lightning lightning round. What do you identify as the aspects of New York City that are genuine and sustainable and lasting, and what aspects are cheap and short term? I want one from each of you, starting with, let's say, Luca as the tourist. Okay. Can you say it again? Which what's your what part of New York is your favorite that is sustainable, long-lasting, and eternal, and what part's cheap and short-term? Okay, thank you for asking because this is something I wanted to say before. Uh, I think that uh, um, I'm always very much in love with river, riverside, waterfronts. This is where life. Uh, you know, we can all agree on this. You know, you can really see how life is uh, flowing when it's. Uh, you know, very close to riverside or waterfronts, and people are, you know, jogging or biking or just, you know, staring at the sun. So, uh, for me, the great example of how New York, I I you know, somehow reimagined itself is, uh, yeah, all these great example: Brooklyn Bridge Park, the new, uh, close to the Domino Sugar Factory. Uh, but even the mm, great uh, park by Louis Kahn on the Roosevelt Island, I was there by myself two days ago, and I was m you know, mesmerized by the beauty of that place. So yeah, I think that the relationship with water in a city, even if it's you know, riverside or you know, waterfront, is very, very important for me. All right, that was not lightning, lightning, but story, lightning, lightning. Um, so I'm going to go, so our you, public spaces, um, and really the, like the, the use of public parks. All right. Um, I'm going to say the coffee cart. I feel like New York is f chock full of examples of ways of new people getting some kind of entry and opportunity. Paul. I want to stick to fine grain. I, I want to talk about great mixed use city streets that have all kinds of uses. And the opposite of that is streets that are lined with banks and pharmacies. No. That's the cheap stuff. Thank you, and I would say, build, building off this as moderator, I got, since no one will criticize, thank you for that note of criticism, Paul. I would say, to me, the most pernicious trend in New York is is the scale of money and development. And not not even the Hudson Yards. The one that frightened me in a bit was uh, actually the made-up neighborhood of Dumbo Heights in Brooklyn. The Kushner properties that moved into the Watchtower, where literally you could watch as they literally took the wrapping off an entire row of restaurants for all those workers, and they were all the kind of you know vegetarian, high-end lunch places. But you could watch a prefab neighborhood being made, and I think the more that New York goes in that version, where you build entire blocks at a time and you populate them with seemingly distinct but really all developed co-simultaneously, co we really run the risk of just stripping out all of that fine-grained, bottom-up evolution that makes New York City great. So with that, thank you all so much for coming. Please give a round of applause for my panelists.